to the next series of AnyCloud Market Movers. Uh, this series is focused on industry influencers, partners, and luminaries on what brands, manufacturers, and retailers need to do to reignite growth in this very special period that we are in. Um, with me today is Dilip Keshu. He is the founder and CEO of Born. Uh, Born is an amazing partner, and, and Dilip himself has a wealth of knowledge that he can impart on us. Uh, welcome, Dilip. Great, great to have you here. Thanks, Al. I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, Dilip, you know, we, we have been hit by, by the train. Uh, all of us are now a little bit in a shock mode, but what I have seen in the last week is some of us are starting to get out of the shock mode and say, and, and, and confront our new reality. Uh, whatever that definition of reality for us may be, uh, that remains to be seen, you know, broadly defined, I mean, you've seen this a few times in, in your career, uh, in different places, um, you know, according to you, are there any learnings we can take away from back in 2008 and 2001? And granted, there are very different situations. We've never been hit by a pandemic like this, so different, but yet at the same time, something similar. You know, any thoughts on, on what we can learn from the past and, and maybe apply, uh, specifically if you're in the shoes of, of a customer of ours, like a brand or a retailer or manufacturer in this case? Yeah, it's, a, it's an oft-discussed topic, as you can tell. Everyone is asking, what, what, what do we do now? What's the future? Uh, have we seen something like this before? What can we learn from the past? You know, my advice to the folks who have spoken to me is that never underestimate the elasticity of the human spirit. We, uh, in 2001, I was an entrepreneur, got hit by 9-11, and we thought it was a terrorist act, it was limiting uh, uh, fallout, but it turned out to be a global event. It devastated many sectors. And uh, it took many years to recover, but as you can see, we overcame that. It changed a lot of behavior. You know, we, when we went to the airport to travel, and you and I are businessmen, we travel a lot. We got accustomed to even our shoes being infected. You know, that's the level to which we, we had to adjust. So we've seen these things before. This is, of course, a different sort of uh, crisis. And I think it affects um, many things because of the nature of um, it's affecting human beings. And so, you know, I've broken it down to a few simple uh, structures. So, um, Al, as I was saying, uh, we've seen crises like this before <clears throat> and we've dealt with them. Our advice to companies is uh, really to break the problem down into how that change might affect us. Uh, the first um, is methods, you know, how we work. You've seen how um, social distancing has been implemented. We don't like that oxymoron. You know, social means be friendly and distancing means the opposite. So we don't like to use that. We call it non-physical linking. We, we want people to be in touch, but we want them to be not physical, physically together. So that's certainly going to change. We think that the tools that are going to be implemented to facilitate uh, this change is going to change dramatically, and you play a part in that. We think that uh, if restaurants are empty, they can probably do pickup services and curbside services, so they have to go online, so that will change. I think we've also looked at behavioral changes. Not everyone deals with the crisis the same way, uh, so it's the way you lead, it's the way you follow, it's the way you interact, that changes quite uh, dramatically. Then the consumption patterns change. You know, businesses uh, see people consuming their brand differently on different channels. One thing I can tell you is that in retail, we've seen that empty out. So people will still engage with the brand if the medium is through broadcast, uh, if the medium is through second screen, if the medium is something that is not physical. Uh, you can still do business, but the consumption of the brand has changed, and that's where it, the business has to change. Then we've seen government and regulations change. You know, there are visa regulations, uh, people can't travel to certain countries, so that's going to have a huge effect on some companies. 
Then you have finance change. A lot of companies have had to take government loans and they have to consider whether they keep their staff, follow their staff, lay off their staff. What do they do with their contingent labor that might be actually cheaper? Uh, but there's the moral issue of who do you keep and who do you let go? And the last and the most important is how do you take care of yourself? You know, it's all, it's, everything is fine, but ultimately you have to boil all of this down. Uh, we call this the magnificent seven, right? The seven points have made to what does it mean to you? And how has it changed your life? How do you buy? How do you sell? And how do you cope with this? So that's really um, our, our, our uh, feedback to people that uh, you have to make it personal and make it something. But we believe that we'll overcome this uh, uh, easily. It's only a matter of time, as, as we both agree, uh, that we will overcome. Uh, if people haven't read Dilip's blog post on the Magnificent Seven, I highly recommend that, that people go and do that on LinkedIn and find it. Uh, and by the way, if you don't follow Dilip on LinkedIn, uh, that's the first thing I would do. His, his posts are, are uh, amazing. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, I, by the way, just on the sidebar, on the fun side, uh, always there's uh, one about his cat, which I always look for. Um, and, and so uh, the cat's missing from the video, but, but very excited to have you, Dilip. And this is great. I think uh, I wrote a little bit about, you know, this behavioral change as well. And, and my, my letter was an open letter to emerging brands, which was, you know, while we talk about all the doom and gloom to many of our favorite brands, there are some emerging brands out there that are seeing some positives from this uh, impact. Uh, these may be ch brands that sell into grocery chains. One example is a soup brand that is selling significantly because Campbell's soup is out of distribution and their distribution has suffered through this process. And for some brands, this is an amazing, amazing opportunity, while for many others, it's a very big challenge. And my letter was to those brands that are, you know, on the positive side, which no one talks about, not many people talk about, that may not be Zoom, but they're still seeing a significant upsurge that they will see this drop off when people's distributions get better. And what they can also focus on, you know, while they're working on the challenging aspects as to how to keep up that demand uh, once this is all done. Once this is all done and distribution gets back to normal, can they keep those customers around that they have uh, got because of this challenge? And, and some of these brands don't have the digital techniques in place to keep these, to stay in touch with those customers uh, because they were natively selling through retailers maybe, or they were one level away from that customer. Uh, we've been talking about this digital acceleration for a good 25 years. Uh, and every year it's more important, but now this topic is coming up even more often is how you get in touch directly with your customer, especially when you're a brand, how do you accelerate digital? Philippe, what are your thoughts for those brands that either are suffering because they now got shut down and digital was not a channel for them, or they are doing great, but digital is a channel they didn't invest in, but they want to keep their customers going forward. Um, what, any advice for, for those brands that are not digitally native? You know, they, they don't have a choice, right? Every crisis wants society to adjust to the normal and um, those brands that have focused largely on stores and events, um, even call center sales, right? They'll have to make a change because all the call centers outsourced. They are, they are working from home. They don't have telephony to cope with it. So there's a degra degradation of service. In a lot of channels that brands have put out, and in order for them to survive. There is no option. They have to, at some stage, find the money. The issue is really this. They are not buying because retail store sales have gone down, so they don't have the money to invest in digital. Uh, so you have to go digital, but you don't have the money. And, then, you know, it's you're in a bind at this stage. So it'll take, a, I would say, you know, a full couple of quarters for these brands to bounce back. And of course, the challenger brands that have gone natively digital will see a huge uptick because they're going to have, they're going to grab market share, at least till the other brands catch up. And that's where, you know, some someone like um, uh, you play a big part because at the end of the day, when you have a crisis, it, it, the one thing that gets impaired is the ability to discover a new brand. You know, uh, if you're on a certain channel 
and you're looking out for a new brand, um, you know, you will find those that are digitally native. But if you have a brand that's already on, let's say, the web, you'll generally stick with your the ones that you know uh, because you had an experience with them. So loyalty plays a very big part. And a lot of companies have implemented custom solutions for that. And, uh, you know, if they have a solution that can change rapidly because of the changing new normal, which is what a system like yours can do, I think it, it will help. Uh, but really, the, uh, they don't have a choice. I mean, I think uh, people will have to get adjusted to this new thing. Now, Dilip, I think, uh, you know, you brought up a topic that's near and dear to our heart, which is, you know, in a recessionary downturn environment, you know, the first thing you think about uh, is how do I keep my customers? How do I re-earn my customers? Um, you know, one of the things I was telling telling my wife is, you know, I've, certain, I've suddenly realized I don't need another pair of jeans anymore uh, because I don't wear them. And I'm not going to try another brand that I have not bought before. If I need one, I will go back to the brand I probably have. Uh, and, and if that brand is in touch with me, I think that will be much better. Uh, so retention is, is, the, is the new norm and, and, and it's something that will really stay uh, and become uh, an important part of the marketing uh, initiative, that trust building initiative that is important. Uh, you brought up an important point that a lot of brands have, you know, invested in maybe homegrown solutions, something they may have, something there, uh, but they haven't really engineered a true retention solution one of the things that we believe is retention, you know, is needs to be truly engineered. You have to work at it. You have to work at it across all channels. One more story I can tell you even now is uh, we've got retailers that have all their stores closed and suddenly it become digital only or digital first. And, and in that case, what they've done is done cross channel promotions to get all their store customers to buy online and using that loyalty umbrella, they've been able to effectively do that and, and stay in business. So all of those factors are, are what we are seeing. You know, as you think of, of the mix of retention and growth, um, you know, how, how do you advise, you know, potential customers to think about when they are thinking about coming out of this downturn and focusing back on growth? Um, what channels, um, you know, retention's one, but, you know, or, or loyalty is one, but what channels do you think will work from a marketing perspective that you feel that customers should continue investing in in this new norm? You know, I think um, I don't have the answers uh, yet, but I think we've seen uh, three things that are somewhat sh um, safer. Pets. One is digital, that's obvious. People are spending more time on the web. Second is emails. You do look at emails. You're working yeah. from and then the third is broadcast. You do to, you know, people do watch TV. And that channel had sort of decreased to a great extent because not everything is uh, uh, suitable for broadcast ads. Even if it's second screen, I don't mean just TV, but it's also uh, the second screen social media channels. Right? So I think these are the three big channels that I think we will see. There's also gaming, but, you know, that's very specialized. Um, but more than the channels, you know, I think loyalty is a function of four experiences. You know, people always think uh, an experience itself. Uh, I don't think it's that. I, our strong view is that loyalty is an outcome of experiences, and there are four experiences. The first experience is the experience of discovery. If you like a brand during the process of looking for something, that's the discovery process. Right? Uh, you get attached to it. Because something struck you. You had some empathy related to so the second experience is the experience of uh, interaction where you uh, have discovered a brand you start to interact with it and if it's not personalized they're using imagery that doesn't uh, uh, even look remotely um, uh, close to what you're interested in it won't work so mass personalization of content is the interaction piece and that's very important the next piece is after you have the attraction and the interaction you have the transaction you have to buy something right that has to be a very smooth, frictionless path to purchase. And you have to be clear on your return policy. You will have to be clear whether uh, you're going to give them a discount. Um, is this a premium product? All of this plays in, in a very smooth, that's the transact uh, piece. And the last piece is actually uh, what we call the react piece. 
so I, I was attracted to the brand, I interacted with the brand, I transacted with the brand. Now I want to react because the experience was not good. And so that is actually the loop. If you get all four of these uh, anchors correct, then only is someone willing to amplify uh, an, an advocate and become an advocate, right? So that's the fundamentals of loyalty. It's not just, it's not an experience in itself, it's an outcome. So if you don't get these first four pieces correct, you, you won't have a loyal customer, in my opinion. And there are a lot of people who make mistakes in one of these four because they don't have the feedback mechanism. They don't care about reviews and ratings. Oh, why bother? Well, you know, if I go to a hotel and I don't have a good experience, I'm going to go to TripAdvisor and say something about it, you know. And so uh, most people, because we've become publishers at an epic scale, uh, thanks to social media, they tend to... Um, they tend to expect they are entitled to a good experience. So they really react when you have a bad experience. So people are not so uh, in motivated to put a good comment when they get a good service because they expect a good service. They will only put a comment when it's an extraordinary service. But if you get a service that's slightly, just slightly below, below the norm, they will put a, you know, they will detract you on social media. So there is a disproportionality between the positive and the negative, and the negative being more massively amplified. Um, so these are the things that I would suggest, you know, brands look at when they uh, build a loyalty program. Absolutely. And then this is where I, I mentioned the engineering of the loyalty program comes into play. You cannot change the experience per se, but you can you know, create the right incentives or the right, uh, you know, needs for those audiences that are happy, which a majority of your audiences are happy to be able to vocalize those happiness pieces. I'll give you an example from, you know, many of our customers, you know, if you are not in, uh, giving a or engineering a reason for those happy customers to talk, you are absolutely right. Uh, there was a brand that, that who, whose average reviews were 2.3, that was 2.3 on five scale. Now this is a very happy brand with a fairly good NPS score, but reviews were, were showing something the opposite. The, the reason was, as you exactly said, uh, the happy customers weren't saying anything because that was their expectation. Uh, you know, that was the norm. And, and so engineering that on the other side took them from 2.3 to 4.6 on that scale. And, and that's where you can kind of change the, the, the curve, so to speak, as we all talk about you know, in the next three, 12, you know, 36 months, uh, if, if you're a CEO of one of these brands that is affected either positively or in most cases negatively, you know, what, what is your advice in the short term, three months, like maybe stabilize, maybe do certain things. What would that advice be now in a nine month horizon or a 12 month horizon, I would say like midterm, and then what would that advice be over the next 36 months and how is business changing? And how do I categorize, what do I act on quickly? What do I sort of bridge it around at a midterm basis and what should I build for the long term to cover, uh, you know, and, and bring me back into, into where it was? Yeah, you know, in the short term, it's about survival, thriving, keeping your workforce uh, intact and your products and your company intact. So that's really about survival. Absolutely. Once we've understood the new normal and how we've chosen to react to the to this, you will have a business model that will work for you. No two models will be the same because everyone's situation is different. I think in the medium term and the long term, I'm a firm believer that um, if you want to succeed, the product has to be good. You know, a lot of people focus on discounts uh, and they think that that's a measure of loyalty. Uh, to get it up, so you discount the product, and you think people will buy. And you know, when this happens, you build a team where the customer expects to be rewarded, and it's almost Pavlovian. Yes, yeah. you're training the customer to expect something from you, like redemption of points. Uh, I need some benefits, but really, if you look at a truly loyal customer in a really good brand, the focus is. Only one. The customer wants the next best thing. They want a product that's absolutely the best and is fitness to purpose, right? Somewhere the message is lost. You know? So my advice to all the brands is 
go back to your core offerings and look at in the six months because you've got time now we all have a bench i'm carrying a large bench uh i'm you know and uh, you know different companies have set different strategies but this is the time to sit back and use this quiet time to think about when i come back how will i create a product that the market will want and um, right you now i think if people focus on that all the rest is an outcome of what's there itself people are there to buy so i think if you look at the demand and supply chain it starts from what are you offering what are people wanting and all the rest can be just one thing that cannot really be just put out the market for product and service i would suggest to everyone longer term and in term focus perfect great advice short term survive mid term start figuring out go back to your core and scale it long term thrive great advice coming from uh from uh Dilip here Dilip, if people want to reach out to you for advice if people want to reach out to born for help how do they reach born how do they reach you so i'm on linkedin they can reach me on linkedin um they can also come to our website it's uh, borngroup.com and a lot of people reach us through that and of course they can write to our partner manager whose uh, contacts are on the website and we can just Dilip thank you so much this was a pleasure speaking with you again from Eric Cloud thank you everyone for joining us on this series uh, where we invite uh, industry luminaries like Dilip to help us uh, navigate this crisis uh, if you want to follow us uh, on these market movers series you can go to alexcloud.com/marketmovers where you will see uh, a lot of these videos as we add uh, to uh, this list uh, appreciate everyone's time thank you again thank you uh Thank you so much.